Um, my name is Matt Townsley. I'm the, currently the Director of Instruction and Technology at Solon Community Schools. I just finished my eighth year in education. Six of those were as a high school math teacher here in Solon. I taught geometry, statistics, business math. Uh, I also taught some computer classes for a couple of years. Um, went to Wartburg College, uh, undergraduate degree in math education uh, while I was teaching in Solon High School. Completed a master's degree in curriculum and technology at Iowa State University. And most recently, I just finished an advanced certificate, uh, advanced study certificate to UNI, Go Panthers, in school administration. So that's a little bit about me. I understand that you are all uh, current practicing teachers in the area of middle school, high school, or a few elementary um, math folks. So I think we do share that in common, um, a desire really to provide the best education possible to um, to students in the math classroom. What we're going to do today in just a moment is I'm going to switch over to some slides and we're going to go through um, a few activities and also I'm going to share my perspective uh, as a classroom teacher and then also leading this type of change as a district leader. I've had the opportunity to uh, go through a change initiative here in Solon um, where district-wide uh, beginning next year and the next year after that uh, over a two-year tiered process all of our secondary teachers will be embracing these ideas. I'd be happy to talk, talk about that change process I'm going to focus more on what it means uh, as a secondary or as a math teacher to make these shifts in the classroom, what are those shifts that are needed, and also what's it look like in practice. So that's going to be the premise of today. So if you'd like to talk about that change process at the end as well, we'll do that. A lot of time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, slides here, see if I can bring those up to you. All right, let's see if we can do a screen share here. Can you give me a nod there that, that you guys can see the slides? Yes, all right. I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, we're going to title this presentation today, uh, Grading Not the Way Your Grandma Experienced It. Okay, people are laughing, so we're, I can tell we're on the same page now. That's good. Um, just for more information, I have uh, posted these slides online. Uh, tinyurl.com slash UNI Math Ed 2012. You're also welcome to contact me. Brian um, has my uh, email address. And I'm also on Twitter for those that are on Twitter. And I also regularly blog about all things math education, technology, and assessment related at mctownsley.net. I'll post this contact information uh, at the end as well. If you have any follow-up questions afterwards um, that we're not able to get answered, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to help you out in the way that I can. Uh, a little note here, I think I mentioned it. My context is six years as a classroom teacher in which I used these ideas for two years. I've also led professional development for hundreds of teachers across Iowa and on several occasions in other states in this very topic. Um, I want you to know that a lot of these ideas are not uniquely mine. I understand that you've read some of these uh, authors or other authors that have quoted these authors. Bob Marzano, Tom Gusky, Ken O'Connor, Lauren Earl, Rip Wormley. Many others are really the published experts in this field of assessment and grading. So I want you to know that it wasn't just something I dreamed up overnight and um, started using, but really it's putting into practice all the ideas that these authors have already uh, considered. To get started here, uh, we're going to do a little think, pair, share activity. So right now, just think to yourself, in your current context as a classroom teacher, what do report cards mean to you? What do grades mean to you? What do you like about your grading practices? And what do you dislike about your grading practices? My guess is you've started to have these types of conversations through the first and second assessment course I understand you've gone through. So it's going to help me uh, a little bit just to kind of gather where you're coming from before we get started. So think about that here for just a few more moments. Then what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to pair up with someone around you. And in about three minutes, I'm going to ask at least three of you to stand up and belt out nice and loud so uh, I can hear you uh, what your thoughts are to this. So take a moment and just think about it. And uh, once you've had a chance to think about it, go ahead and pair up. I'm going to close down this screen in, um, in about a minute or two. And then ask a few of you to share out. So go ahead and do that right now. Think, pair, share on these prompts, please. Okay. 
Finish your conversations the next uh, 30 seconds or so, please. Sounds like some uh, very engaging conversation there. Uh, if we get three people one at a time to just stand up and uh, nice, uh, nice uh, high school or middle school math teacher voice to share out a summary of your discussion. Question: Do you or is anyone in the room ever given extra credit for kids bringing Kleenexes to class? <laughs> okay, just checking. Hey, thank you very much for sharing. Appreciate that. Another person. Person. I do standards based grading um, in my school, and one of the biggest things that I do not like is I don't require homework. And I think one of the biggest things for me is to encourage students or motivate students to get that homework done. Okay. Um, 
great. All right, well, uh, it sounds like uh, we all have a few things in common. Um, a sense of frustration with our current grading practices. Maybe uh, also some of us have seen glimpses of hope. Um, but at the same time, we all acknowledge that maybe there's some room for improvement in our grading practices. And I think that's why I've been invited here today is just to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've seen have been successful in my classroom and others. So I'm going to bring back the slides here, see if we can get going on those again. Let's see, whoops, they're going too fast now. You guys see the slides now? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, next. Um, here's a quote from a, a, a guy I really respect. He's not anyone new, 1970s or so. A guy by the name of Dan Lordy. He said that the average student has spent 13,000 hours in direct contact with classroom teachers by the time he graduates from high school. So think about yourself. You were once upon a time a high school math student or a middle school math student or all of the above. And unless you were homeschooled, and actually if you were homeschooled, you still had a teacher, whether it was the textbook or your parent or whoever it was that was homeschooling you, um, you have some sort of context that you bring into the classroom. Um, and here's what happens from, from my experience talking with folks like Brian and other um, uh, people that are in teacher education. They do their best stinking job possible in graduate, graduate school or undergraduate trying to share with us some really great practices. But then once we step into the classroom, guess what happens? We often teach the way that we were taught. You know, we get all these great ideas about like inquiry and constructivism and all kinds of cool stuff and even assessment. Then we step into our own classroom and you guys are practicing classroom teachers and you start doing things the way you're always done, they've, they've always been done to you. And it's, ex it's incredibly true when it comes to assessment. How many of you give quizzes once or twice a chapter? Raise your hand. How many of you assign homework every day? Raise your hand. How many of you had those exact same experiences when you were in high school and middle school? Raise your hand. Did someone in your undergraduate or graduate program tell you to do that or did you just do it? Probably just did it because that's the way you experienced it. So Dan Lordy has this idea. He calls it the apprenticeship of observation. It's that we do things as classroom teachers, as educators, because that's the way we experienced it. It's not necessarily because it's the best way, but just because we teach the way that we were taught, or we tend to default to those mechanisms. Not in every sense, but in a lot of senses. That's the thought that's really resonated with me, and something I think we have to acknowledge. So um, here's probably something that a lot of us have experienced or that we do. John Doe takes the quiz. At the top of the quiz, we write, good job, John Doe, because you got 14 out of 16 points. John Doe, because John Doe is that type of student, maybe concerned about his grade, maybe not gets out his calculator, or if you were really a stickler, you'd say, no, you can't get out your calculator, and they have to find out what percent they got on the quiz, right? 14 divided by 16, you figure it out, and it's some sort of percent. The kid translates that into a letter grade and says, oh, I got, I'm getting a whatever it is on the quiz, you know, and then do they look at the bottom of the quiz at all to find out how well they did? No way. John Doe doesn't really care about the problems on the quiz. John Doe might look at the problems on the quiz, but chances are probably not. John Doe might take it home and put it on the fridge if that's the best quiz he's ever had, but chances are John Doe throws it in the recycle bin on the way out of class or stuffs it in his folder or something like that. Deep down, though, we want John Doe to look at that quiz and say, hmm, here's an area I did really well, here's an area I didn't do very well, um, here's a strength or a weakness I have, but unfortunately, our grading practices, the way we just assign numbers like that on quizzes, doesn't help John Doe do that type of thinking. Here's a nice little quote I like to share. Um, it's from an Ed Leadership article. It says, to be effective, feedback needs to cause thinking. Grades don't do that. Scores don't do that. And comments like, good job, sure don't do that either. What does cause thinking is a commitment that addresses what the student needs to do to improve. And that's the, the, the meat of what we need to think about today. If you're taking notes, I'm going to share several big ideas throughout this presentation. The first big idea is that feedback trumps grades, numbers, and percentages. It really does. That's what kids want. Kids want to know exactly where they are when it comes to this idea or that idea. There's all kinds of sports and extracurricular analogies that support this idea. If a kid's the second trumpet in the band 
and wants to become the first trumpet in the band, the kids will go ask the band teacher, hey, what do I have to do to become first player, first trumpet in the band? And the, the band director doesn't just say, oh, well, you're getting a C right now. No, the band director says, you can get better at hitting the high notes, have better rhythm, or something like that. Or the volleyball player who's sitting on the bench and wants to become a starter. Hey, coach, how do I get better? The coach will hopefully say, you need to get better at serving or spiking or whatever it may be. Coach doesn't say, well, you're just not very good. So there's all kinds of analogies that support the idea that kids really want and desire really good feedback. And so that's really the first big takeaway here is that we should be asking ourselves, how often are we giving true feedback to our students rather than just grades, numbers, and percentages? And how does our overall grade system reflect our emphasis on feedback versus numbers and percentages? So that's the first take-home point. Here's a scenario that I often think about when I think about math instruction. There's Bobby. Bobby gets 100% on the homework, 100% on the quiz, and 100% on the test. And then there's Susie. Susie gets 75% in the homework, uh, and 80% on the quiz, and somewhere in between the quiz and the test, Susie has a light bulb moment. Whether it's Susie got some great help from her mom or dad or grandpa or friend or tutor, whatever it may be, and Susie just says, wow, I get it. And so Susie gets a 100% on the test. Let's take a moment right now and do a little survey around the class. Which student do you think knows more? Raise your hand if you think it's Bob. No one's raising their hand that I can see. Raise your hand if you think it's Susie. No one's raising their hand. Raise your hand if you think they both know about the same amount of stuff. Most of you are raising their hand. Here's the problem, though. Which person tends to get a better grade in your classroom? Bobby does, because Bobby learned it earlier than everyone else. Yet at the same time, most of our school district mission statements say that we want all kids to learn, not just the kids who learn faster or learn early or by some arbitrary deadline that we've set. That's one of the problems that we see with traditional grading practices is that it tends to reward kids who, who learn it earlier um, and actually penalizes kids who don't learn as early. Yet at the same time, we acknowledge scenarios like this one in which Bob and Susie have potentially the same level of understanding but different grades in the grade book. Here's another quote. Classroom assessments and grading should focus on how well, not on when, the student mastered the designated knowledge and skill. We really need to keep that in mind. If you're taking notes again, the second big idea here is that we need to allow new evidence of learning to replace old evidence of learning in the grade book. Now, if you say this to your colleagues, and maybe even to some of you, you, you might have a lot of pushback on this idea. Hold on, hold on, what? Come on. I mean, you're telling me the only thing that happens here is that who cares how kids do on the first try? It's all about how they do on the end. Well, I got a newsflash for you. If you go to get your driver's license and you fail the driver's license test the first time, they don't say, oh, you know what, too bad, don't come back again. They say, yeah, come on back again in a week or whatever. You take the driver's license test again and you pass it. On your driver's license, they don't put, congratulations, you can drive, but you got a C. No, they just say, here's your driver's license. They, this is exactly what a lot of our, of our colleagues, our, 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 our teaching profession is saying when they're saying, well, just do traditional grading practices and only reward kids who learn early. We really need to allow new evidence of learning to replace old evidence of learning if we're going to embrace the idea that kids truly do learn at different rates. And so that's our second take-home point here is that we need to allow new evidence of learning to replace old evidence of learning. If we don't, we will um, be subjected to this idea of grading pollution in which some of you elaborated on when we started today where Frank aces every test but you know what? He didn't turn in any homework, so we might just have to give him a B in the class. Or Jane scored 85% on tests, but she turned in 15 extra credit crossword puzzles early so she could get her grade up to a B plus. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've ever done that in your classroom. I can confess that I did that for about four years in my classroom. Or maybe there's Sammy who scored 100% on tests but turned in some sort of final project late. 
all of these scenarios could result in different uh, grades, different final grades in your classroom, depending on how you weight your grades, depending on how you consider late work, and all kinds of things like that. Um, but it's, in essence, what we're doing is we're creating this idea of grading pollution, which a B in Mr. Townsley's class might be different than a B in Mrs. Smith's class. Um, yet at the same time, uh, we're trying to tell kids to improve your grade, do better, try harder. Well, when a kid's getting a B, he doesn't necessarily even know why he's getting a B. Because in my class, it might mean that he turned something in late, but in your class, it might mean because he didn't know something. That's what I call this idea of grading pollution. Oh, and then there's the ever-ending questions that we get from our students and from our parents. What can I do to raise my grade? And I heard that from an honest teacher at the beginning, the teacher who had the Saxon curriculum saying, you know what, I don't even honestly know what my grade book means some of the time. I don't know how to tell kids, well, if you want to improve your grade, you need to do this. Sometimes it's you need to turn in more worksheets. Other times it's you need to quit turning in stuff late. Other times it's you need to start participating more in class. Rarely do we ever say, well, the reason that your grade is not as great as it could or should be is because you haven't learned all the stuff yet to a high level. That's what this idea of standards-based grading is all about, is that when a student asks, How, what can I do to raise my grade, we have one answer for that student. You need to learn this math stuff in this math class at a higher level. That's the idea behind standards-based grading. Here's a quote from Ken O'Connor, one of my favorite authors. He says that teachers should use learning goals as the basis for determining grades because those learning goals provide a profile of a student's knowledge and direct evidence of his or her strengths and weaknesses. This type of assessment allows teachers to appropriately plan instruction and allows students to really focus their learning. Again, if you're taking notes, uh, the third big idea for today is that grades, because they're necessary, must have meaning. When I, see, when I say because they're necessary, it's because most of you um, still have to report out letter grades. You're not able to just say arbitrarily, well, I don't really want to give out letter grades today. I just want to do a truly standards-based report card where all I do is report out how well kids understand the standards in my class. Um, particularly for high school teachers, um, some of you might argue, I still have to have some sort of GPA, so I still need to calculate the final grade. So, until we get rid of letter grades, and we can talk about that at a later time, I'd love to talk about how that could happen even tomorrow. Um, but because currently they are required in most of our schools, we need to have meaning. We need to get rid of this idea of grading pollution. Now I'm going to dive in for just a few moments as to how I did this in my classroom. So you might be thinking right now, it's about time he gets past the theory and starts talking a little bit more about practice. So that's what we're going to do right now. The first thing I started doing in my classroom is I started not talking about homework and instead talking about practice problems. I tried to eliminate the verbiage of homework and replace it with the idea that homework was truly practice. And then what I did is instead of waiting 24 hours to give kids feedback on how well they're doing on their homework, you'll see right now what I did is I put the answers to the practice problems on the front board. So right away, as I assigned that, those practice problems to kids, I would say, and here's the answers right away. Because I, I didn't, what's the point in waking, of, of a kid waiting 24 hours really to find out how well he or she did? So it really created a culture in my classroom of kids starting to check their answers at the front of the board. And so I'd have several kids come up and check their answers during that day. I'd have kids come in outside of class and check their answers. I'd have kids come in the next day, like right when, when class started, as part of their beginning of the class routine, they'd continue checking their answers. And they would check them with pencil, because I didn't, I didn't collect homework for a grade after a certain point in time in my understanding of this implementation, because it was really all about kids practicing. And I wanted to create an environment in my class where you could practice and make errors and ask questions. Um, even see that uh, quote above it that says, the person who does the work is the only one doing any learning. I don't know about you guys, but in my math classroom for four years, I would see kids cheating on their homework. Have you guys ever had kids cheat on their homework before? Everyone's shaking their head. Heck yeah. I, I taught on the second floor, and there's kind of like a, a, a lookout where you could look over down the first floor. And I would see kids cheating on their homework. I would see kids cheating uh, outside my classroom in the hallway on their homework. Why were they doing that? Because in my perspective, in my opinion, 
some kids didn't understand at a high level and they were so worried about getting the points that they would risk not learning it and cheating just so they could get the points. Here's another scenario I've, scenario I've been thinking about. When we grade homework, I wonder if we're creating uh, some sort of inequity, some sort of equity issue in our classrooms as well. Uh, think about all of you. You all, if you have kids, um, your kids are at a distinct advantage when they are in middle school and high school math because their mom or their dad is a math teacher. So if they don't understand something in math class, they can come home and they can ask you how to do it and you can explain it to them. Now consider um, Josiah. Josiah's parents um, both work multiple jobs. They're not even home when Josiah gets home because they're working the shift again at the convenience store till 11 o'clock at night. Even if they were home, would they be able to explain it to their kids? Maybe, maybe not. But when we put such a heavy weight on grading homework, we put any weight at all, we're creating an equity issue in which your kids and my kids have a distinct advantage in doing well in their homework and we're putting these other kids at a disadvantage because they cannot necessarily get the same assistance as someone else and be that early learner that we're rewarding in our current grading system. So that's another thing that really resonated with me when it comes to grading homework. Another and the final take home point here is that we need to stop hiding behind points. Here's what I mean by this. Um, if a kid would cheat on their homework or a kid would not do an assignment, um, what I used to do is I used to just give them a zero. And I would assume that if they got a zero, they would automatically think, oh, Mr. Townsend just gave me a zero. I need to start doing my homework. Yet we all know as practicing educators that just when we give a kid a zero, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to start doing their work. And what I really should have been doing to that kid is I said, you know what, Johnny? I noticed you didn't turn your homework for the third night in a row last night. What's up, man? Is there something I can help you out with? You don't understand it. You're going through a difficult time at home. What's going on? What can I do to help you get back on track in this class? Because practicing is really important. These practice problems are really important. But I would hide behind those points. I didn't have the guts or the gumption to talk with my kids. And instead, I would give them a zero. And I, I found out really quickly that when I started talking to kids, now not every kid, but a lot more kids would respond to me pulling them aside during class and actually talking with them about what's going on in their life. A lot more kids respond when I did that when compared to me just putting zeros down their homework and assuming that they were going to start doing it now and stop cheating. So that's the fourth take home point is that we need to stop hiding behind points. One thing that we could start doing instead is we could start giving students some sort of um, traffic light feedback. If a kid um, is doing really well, we could put a, a good write green on there. Or we could even ask kids when they turn in their practice problems to start traffic lighting their own work. We could say, hey kids, when you turn in your homework today if you, or your practice problems today, if you think you really understand this, could you write green at the top? If you still have some questions, could you write yellow? And if you're totally lost, could you just write red at the top? It's just a simple way for you and me to communicate and find out how well you're doing. So we could start traffic lighting our practice problems. Here's another thing I started doing, and this was really powerful. Rather than giving a 14 out of 16 quiz feedback, instead what I started doing is I started breaking down the quiz by learning targets or standards or objectives, whatever language you want to use. And you can see here that I have learning target one. This is from a geometry class. Learning target one was connected with problem number one from the quiz. Learning target two was connected with problems two through four and seven on this quiz. What I would do is before a kid would turn in a quiz, on the back was this Likert scale, and I would have kids in pencil circle where they were, where they thought they were on the quiz. So if a kid on learning target one, problem one, looked back there and said, man, I really have no idea what the heck I'm doing on this quiz, they would circle, need lots of help. If a kid really thought they did well, they could circle the I get it or somewhere in between. And they would do that for each one of the learning targets. Then what I would do, rather than grading them at night, I would go through and I'd write in the correct answers on the front. I'd write some feedback comments. You know, what I would do in pen on the back is I would circle the part of the Likert scale where I thought they were. You see how that can create a conversation in your classroom? We all have the what I would call the high confidence, low competence kids who always think they're doing well and they circle far to the right. 
but they're not really doing very well and we circle to the left. This could be a really great conversation piece to share with parents at parent-teacher conferences. Hey, here's an example of a quiz and where your kid tends to think they are, but really where they are. Then what I would do, rather than just handing back the quizzes and say, all right, who has questions? Because my experience was if I asked who has questions over a quiz, the smartest kids in the class would raise their hand and ask the question like, hey, could you do number three? I would spend five minutes doing problem number three, and they would figure out exactly what they did wrong. Meanwhile, the kids who didn't give a rip or who didn't understand would be sleeping in class because they weren't paying attention as I went over the quiz. So how could I create a more engaging experience for these kids when they get the quiz back? Well, here's what I did. I would take, let's say Johnny did really poorly on learning target one, but did very well on learning target two. Let's say Samantha did really well on learning target one and did not do very good on learning target two. Guess who I'm going to pair up when I hand these quizzes back? I'm going to say, hey, Johnny, hey, Samantha, you guys get together. I want you to talk about your quiz. I would strategically match up kids who had relative strengths and weaknesses together to discuss the quiz. So it would be five or ten minutes of structured chaos in the classroom where kids would be talking about their responses to the quiz and helping each other. And of course, there were certain kids or certain groups in the class where I would just beeline right to their desks or their tables, and I would start helping them right away. But I could be more of a facilitator during that time rather than someone just doing problems on the board. And of course, if there was still a theme after that structured chaos time of a certain, a certain standard that kids still were, understand still were not understanding, I might reteach at that time or launch into a new lesson or go over some of the common questions that students had. So that was just a way that I tried to bring feedback together with more of a standards-based approach um, that really got kids talking to each other and created a collaborative classroom environment. Then what I did on tests is I uh, did the same type of thing, but instead of the Likert scale, I just started assigning kids a, a number for each standard. A one is they attempted the problem all the way up to four where they demonstrated a high or a thorough level of understanding. 3.5 was, well, they probably had a good conceptual understanding, but they had some sort of mathematical error that um, really kept them from having a what we would call a correct answer. But it was de definitely a evident that they had a good level of understanding. And so I would assign kids on a test then for each learning target one of these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 3.5, and 4. Here's what my grade book then looked like. Instead of test, test, quiz, quiz, homework, 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 instead I put chapter 3, learning target 1, chapter 3, learning target 2, and so forth. Or instead of that, I could have actually listed out the learning target. I happened to use PowerSchool, and so parents, when they logged in, they could click on chapter three, learning target three, and then it would pop up and it would actually list a narrative of what that learning target was, you know, like can find the area of triangles or something like that. So you'll see here what the grade book looked like. Um, for a while on the far right here, I did also list out the practice problem scores, but I did not include it in the grade book. Later on in different iterations of this, as I got better, I didn't even report that out as, at all. But as I tried to get parents used to this idea, um, I wanted to also continue to report out how many assignments they were turning in. And so I would zero weight that in the grade book, but I would still report out, okay, there were 14 assignments in this chapter and your kid turned in 14 of them, just for the purpose of reporting out to parents because they were used to seeing that in the grade book. But later on, I phased that out. So that's what the grade book looked like. Here's the kicker, though. When I started changing this classroom assessment thing in my classroom, um, it really was the beginning of a revolution, a revolution of changing all kinds of classroom practices. I used to do warm-ups in my classroom. I started thinking, why do I do warm-ups? Why do I give kids for doing warm-ups in class? How could I use these warm-ups to help reteach certain standards or concepts that kids weren't understanding on previous assessments? I also used to not allow kids to uh, retake assessments after a test. Why did I do that? What I started doing later on is if a kid was at, you know, a two out of four on some sort of standard and on that test and um, they still wanted to earn a, a higher grade or a higher mark on that, I would say, you know what, that's great. I want you to learn it too. Um, it's going to require a little extra work for me to create a new assessment prompt or prompts for that specific standard. So I'm also going to require of you some extra work. Could you come in and do some tutoring, or could you demonstrate to me you've done some extra practice problems? Here's some more problems you could do that would help you relearn 
uh, this standard. Here's the section of the textbook you could read. Or here's a video from Khan Academy or something like that that you could check out to help relearn this concept. If you could provide proof to me that you put in some extra time, I will put in some extra time for you. Um, think of it as an insurance policy, if you will, Johnny. Um, and if you do these things, I'll provide you with another opportunity to demonstrate a high level of understanding. And if you're at a two out of four on chapter three, learning target three, and you can come in and you can demonstrate that you're now at a four level of understanding, I will go in the grade book, I will delete the two, and I will replace it with a four. And I got to the point where I would list out all the standards for an entire semester on a piece of paper as well, and have kids track their own progress on that piece of paper. Here's all the standards, and as they got their test back, they would write in where they're at on all those standards. And then if they did better later on on a reassessment, I'd say, make sure you list it in pencil so they could erase their two and they could write in a four on their own piece of paper. And so that piece of paper that they had mirrored what was in PowerSchool on our student information system in the gradebook. All of these things started happening in my mind when I started to really think about feedback and using the gradebook to become a feedback mechanism rather than just the A, B, C, D report assignments out mechanism. So, to quickly summarize here, um, this is not the way your grandma experienced grades. We really need to allow new evidence of learning to replace old evidence. We need to make sure that our feedback trumps grades, numbers, and percentages. And grades, because they're necessary, must have meaning. And finally, we need to stop being uh, a chicken, if you will, and hiding behind points and really stepping up and having some legitimate conversations with our kids rather than giving them zeros in the grade book. I'm going to pause right now because I've talked for quite some time about my experiences. Uh, Brian mentioned you guys might have some good questions related to standards-based grading or these ideas, so I'd be happy to answer those right now. I have a question. I've really been... Um and I'm the one in the Saxon math, uh, and I'm thinking a lot of my students are remedial. They might be 9th, 10th, or 11th graders in pre-algebra. And a big reason they might be there is because they just don't do the practice problems, the homework. They're not highly motivated, uh, along with some other things, probably some retention issues, talent issues. Sure. And I'm worried that um, if I go to this standard space and homework uh, is not uh, graded almost like, um, you know, a reward or punishment type thing, uh, are they going to just not do anything at all? If the homework's not, uh, you know, a punishment or a reward, a carrot or a stick or anything, why would they do it? And some of these kids reason that way. Sure. Here's a, a, a couple, um, a couple a couple of things from my experience, whether it was myself in the classroom or talking with teachers in other areas that do it. Uh, one thing, and this is from my own classroom, is a conversation I had with um, an entire class at a time and follow-up type conversations with kids. Um, and this was a you know, geometry class with uh, kids all across the board. And so I had this conversation. I'd say, all right, um, at this time my homework was worth three points and I was getting ready to kind of launch into the system, three points a day. I said, how many of you would do the homework if it was worth two points? Most kids would raise their hand. How many of you would do the homework if it was worth one point? Some kids would raise their hand. How many of you would do the homework if it was worth zero points? And only a couple of kids would raise their hand. I'd say, okay, hey, Frank, thanks for being honest and raising your hand. Um, why would you do the homework if it was worth zero points? Frank would say, well, I want to get an A in this class. I need to do the homework. Or my parents would make me do it or whatever the heck the reason was. I'd say, hey, thanks for your honesty. I appreciate it. I'd say, all right. Um, Jamie over here, why didn't you raise your hand? Why wouldn't you do the homework if it was zero points? And Jamie would say, well, I'd rather spend time, you know, making out with my girlfriend or playing Xbox or whatever it is, the excuse that I want to have because I don't want to do the homework and who really cares about homework, you know? And uh, so I'd say, you know, Jamie, thanks for your honesty. Jamie, if you didn't do the homework, how well do you think you'd do on the test that's next Friday? Uh, I don't know. I'd probably fail it, Mr. Townsley. Hey, Jamie, thanks for your honesty. Jamie, if you didn't do the homework on the next chapter, how well you think you'd do uh, on that test? Uh, I'd probably fail at Mr. Townsley, but doggone it, I'd be really good at Call of Duty, ha, 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 you know? And, all right, Jamie, thanks for your honesty. Jamie, now that you said that, how many tests do you think it's going to take before you realize that doing these practice problems is really a good idea? I don't know, three or four or five, Mr. Townsley, uh, you know? 
All right. Th thanks for asking, Janie. Don't you think it's a good idea if you start doing the homework right now and you continue to have those conversations with kids? My experience is, and I didn't do this for four years, is that a lot of teachers haven't had those types of conversations with kids. And so they, we have to help kids make those connections because kids don't always know what they don't know. And um, another thing that we can do is we can create intermittent carrots, if you will, to kind of wean them off it. We can say, well, you know what, um, homework's not going to be worth anything, um, but until you do the homework, I'm not going to let you take this quiz. And you can play kind of a, one of these types of games, with the, you know, a battle of the wills. You just can't do it. You're, I'm not putting you in a good situation right now to demonstrate your understanding if you don't have a track record of doing your homework. On the other side, and this isn't what you were asking about, there are some kids, those high flyers, that this is going to be a breath of fresh air. Because we've been asking them to do homework for a long time, 20 problems a night, 10 problems a night, 50 problems a night, when they really only need to do one, two, or three problems a night to really figure out if they get it or not. Um, another th thing that I've heard um, of teachers doing is just slowly weaning them off. Homework used to be worth three points. Now it's only going to be worth one point, but you're going to weight it only 5% of the grade as you kind of walk this fine line towards these ideals I've just talked about to really help your grade, although you'll still admit that your grade is polluted, your grade will become less polluted as you slowly wean kids off of this sickness that they have, uh, this addiction that they have to getting points for the homework. But it's really this whole idea that we've created for them because we have given homework points for a long period of time. We've created this monster of our own. I don't know if that helps at all, but that's just some of my experiences that can hopefully help you out. Uh, uh, good. I still have the uh, kids turn it in with the traffic lights or other mechanisms. Um, and at that time where I was reporting out in the gradebook, I still actually put that in there, zero weighted. And then later on what I did is I just kept a paper gradebook. I just checked when kids turned it in. So be, it, that would still come up in conversation with parents is, is my kids still turning in the homework? So I would still have them turning in, but it just was not a part of the, of the final grade. Um, one suggestion, um, I'm just sort of thinking about my practice and how it could work well in that sense of not having homework worth any points is actually what used to do is um, called prelims. So even if on our, we have a sign sheet, has whatever problems, the first night after we learn a new skill, I only get three to five of those questions. And then I would randomly call them to present the answer and work um, to the class the next day and then assign the whole um, assignment. And you still get kids that don't do it, and so if they're called on, there's a little bit of embarrassment, but that they typically, if that happens once or twice, they make sure they have them done. So that would be one way that, um, you know, like Brett was saying, that's another way to get them to be doing it and knowing that they're doing it, even if it's worth zero points. So um, if they know that they have a responsibility to share um, their work, that's, and it helps me to know, hey, i got to reteach that, no one, no one got that skill that I thought that they did, and, that's a great idea. Wow. How do you balance the workload of the retakes? Good. Well, um, in my experience, um, the what, and here's how I start out. I let retakes at first be a free-for-all. In other words, any kid, any time can retake any standard. Then I had to create that insurance policy type process um, where a kid had to do something to earn it and it was the tutoring session or the extra problems. So for example, at the end of the test, I might list all the learning targets on the board on a piece of paper and then I'd put, if you are considering reassessing, here's the problems I want you to go and complete and here's the answers for them so that they can prove to me that they've gone and put in some extra time. Um, believe it or not, uh, when we require something like this, extra of our students, um, there's not going to be as many kids as we think or that we can imagine or dream that are reassessing. Another thing that I did um, is I started uh, at times, like for example, my sister teaches, uh, well, at the time she taught um, fifth grade, she taught different lower or upper elementary, and she would have her kids schedule the assessments. Um, so for example, if you want to reassess, you can come in on this day, every Thursday afternoon, or these days after school, or before school, or study hall, whatever structures in your school to do that. Uh, so. 
there's kind of some little things you can put in place, some tweaks you can put in place to manage that. Uh, and then what I started doing is I used like a, a test bank where I kind of created my own test bank of prompts that I thought were quality uh, that assess kids at high levels on certain standards that kids, um, over time, over several semesters, uh, that, kid, that I could use as kind of backup solution, backup prompts and questions uh, to kind of manage that workflow. But to be honest, it creates some extra work right away. It really does. I noticed when you showed the screenshot of your grade book, that you had a section that said like chapter whatever practice. Was that uh, do you grade, do you put, was that just an example where you weighted at zero or? Yeah, that was what, I was showing that to, to kind of scaffold the process for those that maybe aren't willing to give up reporting it in the grade book yet. So at that point in time, that screenshot came from when I was still reporting it, 14 or 16, whatever it, whatever it was, was the number of assignments. And so I just put in the number that they completed and then zero weighted it. And then as I continued on and semesters later, and uh, kids and parents started to understand what I was doing, I would no longer report that in the grade book. Matt, I have a question for you. <coughs> How has your, um, has your curriculum helped you to go about this process? I mean, does it align well? Or do you think, I mean, obviously this probably can be done with any curriculum, but I would think that some are certainly easier yeah. to do than others. Yeah. Um, when I taught, we had a you know a pretty standard um, you know apprentice hall geometry textbook, statistics, and so forth. Um, my experience when I my first teaching gig, they said, "Here, you're teaching geometry." I said, what, "What am I supposed to teach in geometry? The whole textbook?" Oh yeah, here you go. Just teach it. Um, and I was really frustrated with that because there's no way I knew I could get through the entire geometry textbook, whatever that meant in in a, in a semester or a year or whatever it was supposed to be. Um, and so this whole process helped me really start identifying what are the most important things I want kids to learn. And so no matter what curriculum you uh, inherit, it helped me really start to identify the things that I really wanted to emphasize and spend the most time on by that concept or that standard. And there were some things that really just had to slip by the wayside. And if I had time, sure. But if not, I was just going to skip that standard and, uh, because it wasn't important. So I could see some challenges with, for example, Saxon, because I know it's really a spiraling curriculum, a spiraling textbook. And so you, you probably have to do some work ahead of time to find out, here's the problem sets that relate to this standard and so forth. Um, I know some of the standards-based approaches, uh, I think you could probably still do it. Uh, you probably have to break down your assessments. Um, I could think of, uh, I think it's Key Curriculum Press, uh, like Discovering Geometry, Discovering Algebra, and so forth. Um, they don't have as many practice problems, but there's still plenty in there. And they do a pretty decent job of breaking those down by standard or objective, too. So that's just my experiences, whether that helps or at least gives you a glimpse of the right? How do you differentiate algebra mistakes from concepts like like how do you differentiate whether they understood the concept or whether they just simply made mistakes on the grade? Uh, like if they understand the concept or not, is that what you're asking? How do you do that now? Well, now you would say, okay, well, they, didn't, they made this mistake, so you take off that many points for the mistake, rather than focus on whether or not the concept was correct. Repeat that a couple times, and that's a really cool learning, isn't it, right there? Something that you just said out loud. That's really cool that you acknowledge that, and that's a big shift from our traditional practices. Now it's more of a holistic scoring approach, because now you might have three problems or prompts, and you have to look at those three problems or prompts, you have to find out at what level does the kid understand that. If you have the luxury of working with someone else, you know, a co-teacher that also teaches Algebra 1 or whatever section you teach, I'd recommend getting together and creating some exemplars. Here's what a high level of understanding would look like. Um, what I had to do basically is I had to look at those standards, you know, Chapter 3, Learning Target 3, Area of a Triangle. And I had to decide to myself, what did that look like? And because I didn't have the luxury of having a co-teacher, I just arbitrarily decided that for myself. Um, but that's maybe something if you teach in a big district, uh, you might have other folks to collaborate with. Um, but really came down to more of a holistic scoring approach. 
and I had the luxury of working at uh, ACT and Pearson for a few different summers on some holistic scoring projects, and that's kind of how I got my holistic scoring uh, feet wet, if you will, was really starting to not look at, they made this mistake, so take this many points off, but here's their, this body of knowledge. Do they have a high level of understanding or not? There's not really a good answer I can think of other than to just change your mindset, and you've elaborated on that mindset very well. Final questions for Matt? All right, Matt, thank you very much. Can we give Matt a hand? Feel free to uh, contact me uh, in, uh, in the future. Uh, if there's any questions that you have, I'd be happy to help out. Um, Brian has my contact information. But uh, thank you very much. I'll also send Brian a copy of this recording on YouTube in case you'd like to check it out or share it with any of your colleagues. Have a great summer. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Matt.